Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming here. You are the best. Uh, yeah, my name is Bartosz Domicek, and I'm a CG artist from Poland. And generally, I named my presentation The Lonesome Traveler, and that's because I've been working pretty much solo uh, throughout my entire career. So I will tell you a bit about my background, a bit the specifics of my work today about my thoughts on being the individual within this industry and how it might change in the future. And in the end, I have the new personal project under development at the moment, so I can show a bit out of it. But I have a tendency of running over time here, so uh, in worst case scenario, I'll just like click through the images, so we'll see. All right, uh, but to start, we have to come to the very beginning, and there is the mirror face is the term uh, created by the famous French psychoanalyst Jacques Lelac, and it's about recognizing, recognizing ourselves in the, mirror, in the mirror for the very first time. Uh, and it is a kind of unsettling because uh, we discovered that our inner self, like chaotic, ever changing polysexual uh, core, doesn't correspond with the stable entity we see in the mirror. Uh, with these well-composed and symmetrical features. And uh, maybe after this a bit complex and grim introductions, here I am as a young kid, and I happen to remember some random events from my childhood and recognizing myself in the mirror, maybe not for the first time, but one of the first is one of them. I remember this kind of admiration for life, and uh, I must agree with lack about the existence of the gap, but I think that thanks to creativity, we can Transcendent, uh, transcendent at least for brief moments. So generally, uh, my major drive for all kind of artistic activity in my life was just to steam off some unbearable internal pressure and to cross this gap. So I have some works from my uh, very early childhood. It was like I was, I don't know, 11, maybe up to 15 years old. Uh, I lost most of them, unfortunately, so I will show just the few that left. Uh, yeah, at that moment I was mostly into painting, like uh, uh, drawing, paint, traditional painting, slowly getting into digital painting. I was also making some music, writing poems, that kind of stuff, or some kind of creativity, but visual aspect was al always the most important for me. So yeah, let's just click through them. Uh, yeah, I kept producing them throughout my uh, teen years. Generally, all the way to my rebel phase, and that was when I had to answer some vital questions in my life, like what would I, uh, would, what would I like to do in future? And that was the time I was hitchhiking a lot, generally living the life of adventure, and you know, living life of adventure months and months on can be uh, can make it really difficult or even impossible for some people to come back to the previous stable life, and they get kind of addicted. But it was pretty much opposite for me. Uh, as I, I felt the best when I can good, could uh, come back home and create something meaningful. So that was the time I decided to combine my future life with creativity and decided to study architecture. Oh, yeah, so one more photo from the time. Weird stuff <laughs> that people are through. Uh, okay, so six long years, but I enjoyed the time. Uh, they allowed us to get pretty much far-fetched at the university. So for example, here's my, my uh, master thesis project. It is about the 40 kilometers high structure sustained by atmospheric buoyancy. Uh, yeah, as crazy it sounds, I wanted it as much ground to earth as possible, so I made all kind of material selections, uh, aerodynamics uh, studies, many, many analyzing, and generally it got pretty vast. It took me almost a year, but really fun time. Uh, yeah, but after graduating, I got immensely disappointed with architecture. It was tedious, repetitive, uh, yeah, kind of really stressful. And uh, of course, I wasn't any kind of idealist. I knew it would be like, like that. But uh, yeah, the one thing I couldn't bear, really, is was like how long the creative process was and how much watered down it began with all the compromises. So I ditched architecture 
pretty quickly and uh, decided to start my own company, company focused entirely on CGI, mostly ArcFizz, but not exclusively. And what's important for this presentation is that I always pretty much work alone. Not because I don't like to work with other people, but I tried and I always find, found myself between the situation of being uh, on the position of the, like a cog in a big machine when uh, working under someone else or in a position of becoming more of a business manager than the artist and I didn't like none of them. So, and I always liked ArcFizz for this possibility to be successful, remain, uh, maintain small scale, and the ceiling is still pretty high. Uh, yeah, so a few, a few aspects of my work that I named after the individual perspective. Uh, so first of all, maybe contrary to this title, the community, I owe a lot to community, and some people say that uh, similar to 50% of global wealth being held by less than 1% of population, that similar disproportion is with access to meaningful creativity nowadays, that it became the privilege of a few and uh, they become kind of icons, while the last is made to uh, perform some kind of imitative work. I don't know if it's true, but uh, I know that our jobs as we are here is kind of special in that regard. Uh, I am constantly surrounded by crazy creative and sensitive people and they keep me, keep me going. I also think that I am kind of characterized with little inertia. It means that ca I can swiftly adapt to new situations. And actually I worked in many various corners of this industry. So of course Arcvis started in university certainly and I remember they taught me to hide everything that's complex behind the greenery. You have the trick. After that, uh, a bit of VFX and cinematic production. Here they taught me to find, uh, to hide everything that's complex behind smoke and flames to keep the budget low. And later on, a bit of advertisement. Uh, here they taught me to, nah, they, here they didn't want to hide anything, just felt like dancing around the fire, watching the world burn and uh, celebrated all that's weird. So, uh, for example, this project was a horror. It was like over 100 iterations. So, by the way, everything that I'm showing, I, I did pretty much alone. Uh, right. So, yeah, to sum this up, in the, wor in the world uh, focused on efficiency and uh, specialization, I rather try to remain versatile and learn my lessons whenever, wherever I can. Um, I think that it happens in the context of changing industry. You know, you know software is getting easier, hardware more accessible. Uh, rookies nowadays can pull off things we couldn't even drum, dream of 10 years ago. Uh, so there are n entire new areas being developed and I believe that in this context the individual artist can be in the avant-garde of these changes if he only has the courage, curiosity, have some hunger for new. Okay, uh, some constraints of the past, so what problems I had at the beginning and as I mentioned I come from the environment of the traditional art, so it's, it's like this, it's synthesis, it's uh, imagination, it's uh, transformation, understatement, spontaneity, these kind of values, and I, uh, hardly, I couldn't use to the fact how meticulously uh, defined the 3D scene has to be to feel credible and complete even the things that are not in the frame like insane hundreds of assets. For example, here's one pretty old project from 2011 on 12. Uh, it was right after Sketchfab started, I remember. It was the first time I stumbled upon uh, photogrammetry. So some of these skulls and antlers are the first uh, 3D scans I used. But still, it required a trashous amount of modeling, texturings and stuff pretty much incomparable with what we have today. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was still the time that there was uh, some uh, 3D stores emerging, so you could already purchase, purchase some of these assets, but it's incomparable with what we have today and what we might get in the future uh, when you know, deep learning and object interpretation comparison algorithms may make it possible to just uh, get the realistic object with a decent mesh out of a single photo. Uh, yeah, speaking of realism, it used to be my third constraint, so this constant strife for hyperrealism. 
Uh, of course, it's nothing wrong about realism. Lacking realism may just break immersion, but it used to, there used to be the time that it was this major category by which each image was uh, judged, and reaching it took so much resources, so much uh, solving out technical obstacles that actually it was hardly any resources left for all other aspects of the project. Right, economic and creative independence. I don't really have time to get in deep into it. Generally, it's the blessing and it's a doom. And it requires a certain mind mindset. Uh, as I'm already pretty short on time, I will just cut through these uh, things uh, really, really quickly. So be the person, because it's, uh, you're your own brand, but also so much more than this. You're your most... Uh, most valuable assets, and not only because of your skills, but rather of what constitutes you, uh, what is your background, who really are you are, uh, what are your dreams, what even are your flaws, because if the art reflects the artist, you and your background uh, appears in the spotlight and it changes everything. And to truly, under, uh, to truly be yourself and not some just failed uh, um, Appearance of self, you need a bit of self-understanding, and that's of course, of course, some uh, basic, basic uh, existential problem: how to truly understand yourself in the world full of, full of distortion and noise. But uh, yeah, we should try. It's not one moment of enlightenment, but rather the ongoing, uh, ongoing challenge that goes throughout our our, our life. And self-development, self-understanding is like the foundation of directed and purposeful self-development. And again, it's not only about uh, polishing your skills, also it, although it's also important, but also growing as a human being. And uh, I decided to uh, dedicate about 50% um, of my entire working time for, uh, for personal work. This, this is my way of self-development. Uh, I, I was, um, as I was putting this presentation together, I got astounded that uh, there are well over 300 images that are made already. And yeah, Fabio told me yesterday that when I was, when I would be switching these slides this fast, it would be like boxing. So here I am boxing you with my personal work, I guess. Uh, yeah, but uh, working on personal stuff uh, generally helped me to establish my uh, schedule to help me with planning my schedule because I used to take on way too much on myself and end up like coordinating six, seven projects in the same time, which was really exhausting mentally. So now I have this uh, kind of buffer of personal time that can be disposed if in need in kind of emergency. But generally, I just feel better about how my work time is composed. And of course, it helps me to have kind of directed, uh, like to have the total control over the di direction I am developing as an artist and how my brand is being seen. It prevents me from burning off, you know, all the kind of useful stuff. Uh, yeah, but you should remember that uh, self-development requires a lot of experimenting. It's really important and generally experimenting uh, implies failure, and we all fail all the time. There's nothing wrong about it. You just uh, shouldn't be really put off by it, and it shouldn't damage your productivity. And speaking of productivity, I also think it's a really crucial skill to keep yourself productive day after day, week after week, year after year. As you are walking alone, there's no boss that's looking uh, from behind you, and uh, yeah, keeping you motivated, stuff like this, you have to do everything on your own. So uh, I find like the three pillars of uh, productivity. The first one is, I mentioned, it's motivation. And I think that staying motivated in the long run is relatively easy, but the trick is about being motivated towards like the everyday simple tasks. And there is so-called Sawyer effect. It's about changing uh, all kinds of work into kind of a game. It just requires uh, small rewards, like small successes that you earn in relatively small intervals. 
So I try to reach these kind of small rewards with my work and help to keep me motivated. Secondly, it's avoiding procrastination. It can be really hard, especially if your work requires a connection to internet. Uh, as for me, it, what helps a bit is keeping to my schedule because it's the moment of indecision between tasks, like when you think what to do next. It's this moment when we tend to wander off into procrastination. So I try to avoid it. Uh, yeah, and the third one is the flow. It's like the personal recipe of various internal, external conditions that let, let, let you to be productive for hours without even noticing the passage of time. And okay, so let's say we are good with ourselves and now what we can achieve. And one may say, uh, you need a big team to cope with big commissions, but thanks to the lack of decisive chain and uh, some improvisations. I, I, it happened to me a few times that I was made. Uh, I was able to make, uh, make chances even. And here's the first project. Actually, uh, it all started about the month after I began with my company. So I was pretty much unknown. But out of luck, I got contacted by some event agency from uh, Berlin. I made some test commission for them. I didn't know at the moment it was test, but never mind. Later, after it, they called me and invited me to their offices, but it all was like in a style, it's super, super, super urgent, take the first possible flight tomorrow morning, and it was already the evening, but I did, and it turned out that they got commissioned by big uh, global sportswear brand to build, uh, to refurbish old tram station to kind of a football center for youngsters, and it was all associated with a Champions League final in Berlin. Uh, this, this place is also in Berlin, so generally it was a great opportunity from the brand to show off. The only problem was that, was that it was already half of March, so they had like uh, less than two months to design and build the entire thing, which wasn't small, like 6,000 square meters, generally insane and I would say undoable, undoable at the moment. But we agreed. And suddenly, a few months after starting company, they started kind of to escape from architecture. I found myself in the position of being responsible for the design of this place. And you should ask, how the hell does some unknown guy get responsible for the design for the big brand like this? And the answer would be, first, I think my renderings uh, got them green light for this project in the first place. Secondly, uh, due to this uh, horrendous restriction of time. Uh, my renderings were the only kind of visual communication we had the project. Without them, there were no communication at all. And thirdly, they, I think it may sound silly, but they have so uh, big vertical structure, corporate structure, they, they, uh, they got literally par paralyzed by this short amount of time they had. So the next two, three weeks were totally manic, like over 10 renderings a day. It's even anecdote. I've been at the main railway station in Warsaw, uh, sitting with my laptop, producing this insane amount of renderings. Then uh, the bomb alert went off, and everybody got evacuated apart from me. I was sitting in the middle waiting to die just because I couldn't disconnect and stop my renderings. But it was, <laughs> it was fortunately false, so I am here, still alive, but our job can be. Uh, maybe I get next one. Our job can be dangerous at times. Uh, yeah, but all right. Uh, it was crazy because I soon, as soon as we got green light on something, I sent orthogonal views straight to the manufacturers. So there was no uh, fully fledged architectural design whatsoever in the middle. Crazy, but it worked, and we are still working together. Uh, generally a few projects a year. It didn't get any easier at the time. They just like this last minute style guys. Okay, and the second example is like this project, you don't see anything apart from the zoomed in plane and maybe this weird color mix, but that's because it's like the 35 meter wide animated digital wall that I made for the Nover Global brand. Uh, Generally, literally, they produce everything, and they wanted to show everything of this rendering. It's like several biomes. And at the same time, they wanted it to be really detailed, uh, to be visible from like 50 centimeters, and they required 150 dpi. So in the context of this 35 meter, it made 
it over 200,000 pixels, which were really rendered. It's not some kind of upscale stuff. And yeah, at the same time, it was animated with weather system, full night, day uh, cycle, stuff like this. All right, so I hope I prove that limits are not so obvious. Generally, there is a lot of responsibility with bigger projects. I know that guys that come to me and maybe not know me earlier are kind of a risky persons with this kind of huge stuff, but yeah, the world is full of daredevils. And uh, this moment of facing big deal is always the moment of question whether to scale up. As I mentioned, it never worked for me. Actually, a few friends of mine scaled down recently from 20 plus people just to freelance because they prefer this ambience of working freely on their own, and they are okay, happy. And I prefer to keep kind of a scattered network of connections and invite people to work with me if in need, rather on the uh, you know, kind of even terms. And uh, I hope that in the future we'll have this kind of artistic clashes, you know, like two musicians meet together and they drop album together and they try to find each other artistically. I hope that we'll have it in this industry as well, as things are getting uh, easier to, and more accessible. Okay, so I want to think about, about the future, and I have this over-complex question, what is the position of an individual artist at the threshold of the age of an algorithm? Is it the doom that awaits us, or will we thrive? And my attempt to answer it, I will try to start with a kind of a digression. Uh, there was the uh, study at the University of Iowa in 2015. It was about hiring, hiring 16 complete rookies and teaching them how to identify malignant breast cancer tissue based on cal calcification patterns like this. A bit tricky, but it turned out that just after two weeks, they were able to reach the efficiency of the professional pathologist. And as you may assume from the previous page, uh, they were not humans, but also not any kind of sophisticated AI. AI would do much better than this. They were 16 pigeons. Uh, yeah, so I'm mentioning about it not only because it's a cute example of science, but also because I want to emphasize how much we tend to overestimate the uniqueness of our actions. Uh, so, of course, the topic of AI taking our jobs is the hot one, and we try to comfort ourselves with the term of creativity, that it's so immensely human that no machine will ever challenge us in this. I wouldn't be so sure after what I see here, but also uh, I have a question whether we are really creative ourselves or rather uh, trying to follow some repetitive iterations on and on, let's say, uh, I know, uh, architecture, interior visualization, we may say that we use our rich experience to build stories, dreams, uh, boost marketing sales with purposeful strategic decisions, but with access to big data and demographics, probably AI would be also really efficient. Uh, speaking about uniqueness of design, following some Pinterest trends, and uh, maybe applying some uh, functional principles, uh, lighting scenarios, composition. They are scenarios that work all the time. We could automate them. So, of course, I am uh, exaggerating a lot, so uh, don't feel offended, but I really think that AI can just reach about, can be just be good enough, reach like 50, 60% of our top quality, and it, this, would, this would change everything. But anyway, it's not my final conclusion, because as I can kind of subdivide our actions into these small repetitive tasks. I also think that we underestimate our ability to uh, find and utilize like uh, holistic connections between these minor subjects. So we are already four years since this study and we have no pigeons uh, diagnosing cancer. Actually, we have even no AI di diagnosing cancer, although it helps a lot. And that's because we are able to see some bigger picture and it changed a lot. And uh, I like books wi which uh, showcase the stream of consciousness type of narrative. So I had to befriend James Joyce at some stage. 
but his final book, Finne Ganswek, it's kind of a mystery, having the structure of mathematical multifractal containing over a dozen languages, a lot of neologies. It's like the nightmare from translator. Uh, I, would, I wasn't surprised that it took over 40 years to get the Polish translation of this book. In fact, uh, it was much easier to get, to get some intersemiotic translation like musical crypto cryptogram stuff like this, but never mind. Just, uh, it's an unreadable, impenetrable piece. Some, uh, some consider it a masterpiece, some other one big joke. For me, it's the evidence of one thing, that, that we are more than the sum of our parts, that based on our knowledge, experience, imagination, we are able to create the purposeful structure, the book in this example, that is, uh, that that's complexity is beyond the cognitive reach of the entire humankind. And this is comforting for me in the context of the dimension that we are finally getting the complete tool set to have our individual, individual say about things, to, to be able to fully realize our visions. Okay, and from this, I believe that we are going to see a lot of new, strong personalities in this industry, having the bold artistic statements. And uh, with this growth of supply, I think that uh, there are going to emerge new niches in the industry. I totally can think about virtual architecture, like the architecture that is not supposed to be built, but rather serve as an aesthetical, functional, and emotional background for virtual actions. And it changed a lot because uh, you have various uh, different perception in VR. You have totally different kinds of movements, so this architecture should adapt. Virtual tourism born from need for conservation and digital backup, allowing to share our cultural and natural heritage to people in the remotest part of the planet, also to those that otherwise couldn't afford to truly experience the planet they live on, but also augmented tourism or answer to people that are disappointed with real traveling because of its far, uh, carbon footprint, because of various local distortions or quiz to the Instagram spots, stuff like this. A visual novel, it's the gaming, uh, gaming industry term, uh, kind of genre, but I think that gaming and artists are going together pretty soon, and there is a lot of new space for experience, new narratives, mechanics, expressions, and I finally think that with this growth of supply, we'll be able to give more curated and individual, individualized answers. Okay, the scorn of men. Okay, we are good with timing, so I skipped a few things, but yeah. The scorn of men, that's my newest project. Uh, it's the working title. Generally, everything is subject to change. It's just the beginning of this project. It's not this one. This is the previous one, Northern Wisp, from the last year. It got a bit of traction, but uh, it taught me one thing. I don't remember now. It was about 20 stills and one short movie, uh, and it was developed pretty organically. So. Uh, it was pretty much inconsistent across the entire piece. But uh, I thought to myself, what could I achieve if I planned everything from the beginning? Because, uh, yeah, you see, the friend of mine, like uh, several years ago, spent about three years of his life and $25,000 to create kind of a short movie. And it was total disappointment. Like, the, the only uh, conclusion he had is that he learned he's not able to do anything alone. And I tried to challenge it again, having a bit different uh, toolkit because, yeah, no, you know, with photogrammetry stuff like this, we have just a lot of more opportunity to do now it all alone. So maybe it's not the mo most wisest thing of me, of mine, to um, spoil the final effect and just uh, disassemble this project here on the stage. But here I am, tearing it wide open. Uh, so you might be witnesses if I would be able to just uh, f re realize it completely the way I hope to. Uh, generally, the first idea was last autumn. It started with the idea for nuclear storage waste kind of place. It's interesting story, but no time for it. So I ditched it, but I adapted the emotional landscape of... of, of the subject, 
And uh, here it is. Generally, uh, it's kind of revolution for me because I am in introducing the protagonist. Uh, the project is a lot about experiencing space, so I need this extension of the viewer. And uh, as I am used to ArcFist and generally creating environment, skinning, rigging, and animating is totally new stuff for me. So maybe it will fail. Uh, I know it's a risky, but we'll find out. It's kind of experimenting. And I chose astronaut. Uh, one of the reasons is because I hope it's his natural clumsiness will cover my crude skill. Yeah, but, but I also love astronauts. They're like universal observers, uh, perfect to depersonalize, can be anybody and nobody. Uh, the bold symbol of human aspirations, they are great. Uh, okay. Uh, so, generally, the design itself is inspired by this thing that I didn't talk about, so this, this uh, natural uh, nuclear storage ways. Uh, for me, it's the regular reminiscence of the giant rib cage, uh, the artifact of long forgotten worlds, like the carcass of symbolic Leviathan, uh, cathedral, uh, hallowed caldera, stuff like this. And it was formally, it's to be the short movie in the first place, and some additional stills. Uh, the things I show generally are subject to change. Some of them are already outdated or totally deleted, but uh, yeah, it's, it's all a work in progress. I think it's also advantage for you to see it and how it develops. Generally, it, uh, the story is divided into two chapters, the first one being the classic sequence of uh, journey of the protagonist, experiencing space, its harshness, uh, repulsiveness, repressiveness, this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, this one is outdated probably. And uh, as the working title may suggest, or not, uh, generally the tone of, of this project, project is uh, about the mankind that got lost in instability, uh, blind consumerism, greed, uh, got devoured by itself, owing, uh, leaving only the monument of its decline. And I am, uh, for example, inspired by this movie from 1980s by Gottfried Reggio. I don't know if you are familiar with it. It's Koenis Katsi, one of the Katsi trilogy. It just, uh, this movie is just the uh, collection of footage of our commonplaceness, our everyday life, our cities, production, stuff like this. But as it gets put together, it shows the absolute madness of the world we live in. And I address similar issues, but having additional 40 years of context and uh, having totally different ways of expression as well. It's the Koyanis Katsi. Oh, it's barely readable here. I read this here. It's uh, Koyanis Katsi is from Hopi Indian language. It's, it means life out of balance, a state of light that calls for another way of living. So this is, this, these are the issues I, I also address. And I also try to build in all my projects some kind of layered details. This is uh, usually, sometimes I find this kind of little wings from other artists in other art pieces I have contact with, like books I read, movies I watch. Uh, they are very subtle, but also rewarding to find. Uh, I think it's kind of the respect for the viewer to include them. I usually don't mention them. Uh, they are probably got missed by 99.999% of people because they are yeah, really subtle. And, uh, but I will, I will tell about uh, one of them. Generally, not, not, not noticing them doesn't change the overall, uh, overall feeling of the project and understanding of it. So they are not so important for the uh, overall uh, yeah, feeling. So for, uh, as you may see, this is this black valley in the front of the building and with sort of geoglyphs in it. In, at first it was random, but I found it like uh, not really fitting uh, for me. So later on I decided to use the existing uh, system of symbol and word description. This is Kabbalistic Tree of Sephiroth, the kind of uh, system of word description. Of course I didn't want to leave it like that because it's uh, out of place, just too anchored into one symbol. But I also wanted, on the other hand, uh, the big body of water in front of this building. So I decided to erode the entire piece 
And as a center of erosion, I chose this uh, sixth sephira in the middle. It's called Tiferet. And this system, it's responsible for the balance. So we kind of get all the way around. And these details tell, this detail tells about the ultimate meaning of the project. So the entire system crumbles from the single crack in uh, the piece that's responsible for the balance. Yeah, so this is like, it's very subtle. You, you won't notice it. Uh, normally, but uh, yeah, it's like giving me special connection to the project, and also it's like just changing randomness into meaningfulness, which doesn't require so much of more of work. It's just like the shift in the mindset. Yeah, and the second part of of this movie, the second chapter, is kind of, I call it uh, the vision. Uh, it's like the golden record uh, on the Voyager spacecrafts. But the difference is it's like the testimony of the decline. So it's totally different. Like uh, the, the pacing of the first part is slow and uh, kind of building ante anticipation, and tension. And this is kaleidoscopic, broken, uh, feeling a bit theatrical about stuff. Uh, it's probably definitely longer part. So I can just switch through uh, random images I, I got here. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's really far from being complete, so everything can change. I'm, I'm not happy with a lot of stuff. It's more, okay. Uh, all right, that pretty much sums, sums up this project. Uh, I don't want to give any kind of useless conclusion here, so maybe we'll have time so for some questions. So I will just end up with uh, anticlimactic. Thank you. If you keep your finger. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs>